because I miss my baby, to be honest. I miss already. She was taken from me. She was taken from me. I want the world to know that Micaiah was beautiful. Joining me now is someone devoted to finding ways to improve police and community relations. He's a motivational speaker, best-selling author, Dwayne Bryant. Mr. Bryant, thank you for being here. When you look at this case from Columbus, Ohio, was there anything else this officer could have done? You know, I have to say it really depends on the officer. When you look at split seconds, officers literally only have split seconds. And when you look at a knife being wielded, the law says the officer has the right to protect his life as well as the life of other people. And it seemed as though this young lady, uh, Micaiah Bryant, could have killed another individual. Now, if it was a different officer, so the question is, was it a justified shooting? I believe all accounts, they will find that it was justified. However, it depends on the officer that's coming. If an officer dehumanizes someone, then the only recourse is shooting or killing. If the officer does not dehumanize someone and sees someone, if he had saw McKay as his daughter, I doubt he would have shot her. I think he probably would have wrestled the knife out of her hand. But that's a 12-hour decision. But the shot, I believe, is going to end up being justified. This does look, as you say, like this split-second decision. And it's agonizing. I mean, like, we experience it with the officer on the body cam. It seems to be 10 seconds or less trying to figure out who has a knife? Who's the victim? Who's the aggressor? What's going on here? Realistically, could this have been de-escalated? Well, you have a few factors. You have the 911 call where the young lady is saying someone is ha has a knife and she's wielding the knife and she's trying to put her hands on my grandmother. Right there, if the police had that information going to the call, I believe his awareness is going to be heightened. His, his, his reflexes are going to be more shoot as opposed to you know, try to de-escalate. There's always opportunities to de-escalate a situation. It really depends on the training and the skill level of that officer. I believe that officer just joined the force in 2019, so I'm not sure if he's a rookie or not, but I think a more seasoned officer, I think an officer who did not dehumanize Mikhail Bryant would have used a de-escalation tactic. Right now, some people are really upset that the officer shot Micaiah, again, a 16-year-old girl, four times. They have a perception that white attackers survive at higher rates when they come into contact <laughs> with police. Based on your research, and I hear you laughing right now, does race factor into split-second decisions like we're seeing? You know, do I need to neutralize this threat in this way right now? What does the data say? Race absolutely is a factor. Here, here's the reality. If I see some children fighting uh, and, and, and they look like me, I will more than likely go to try to figure out how can I solve the problem. I don't have a desire or need to de-escalate, or I'm sorry, dehumanize. Now, for me personally, because I love all humanity and because I'm okay with black, white, Asian, or whatever. However, if I was not raised around black people, if I have bias against black people, if I have prejudice, prejudice against black people, if I am indeed a racist that happened to be in a police uniform, then guess what? Those black people do not get the chance to be innocent. They will be guilty until proven innocent. And if they're moving too quickly, if they're, quote unquote, uh, aggravating the situation, I very well may shoot them. And that's a reality we don't like to talk about. But if you look at all these police shootings, some of this stuff, after a while, it becomes, it can't be uh, uh, accidental. Some of it has to be intentional. Taser, gun, gun, taser. I'm a trainer. I'm not buying that. I'm trying to match that up against some of the data. I pulled this from Statista, like in 2020. The proportion of people who were killed by police in these interactions, 45% were white, 24% were black, a little under a quarter, Hispanic, 17%, um, other 14%. What do you make of that? The greatest proportion are not black Americans at all. Yeah, and, and your data is correct. Here's the reality. More white people get shot and killed by the police than black people. Now, that's just base numbers. So let's take a look at this. I believe it was maybe 2018, somewhere around there, 445 white people were killed by police and 223 black people were killed. So we'll say, aha, gotcha. More white people are killed by police than black people. That's twice the rate. 
but let's look at percentages. White people almost make up over 60% or 50 plus percent of the population. Mm -hmm. Black people are around 13 or 14 percent of the population, which means then that black people are 2.8 to three times more likely to get shot and killed by police than white people. So your numbers are correct, but when you look at statistics and percentages, then your numbers become more alarming. Take me one layer deeper than Dwayne, because there is that perception and it is really powerful. And the numbers, as you say, maybe 2.8 to 3% times more likely to be killed by police if you're black in America. If you look at DOJ data, you know, violent crimes and offenses, um, mm -hmm. black Americans are also uh, offending at far greater percentages than they represent, mm -hmm. you know, in the aggregate. And so does that bring you into contact with police more and, and put you at more risk? Okay, that is a great question. So check this out. Uh, next week, I'm going to the Seattle area and working with the police department there. Mm -hmm. When I look at the raw data, in this particular community, 10% of the community is black. 53% of the homicide shootings and things of that nature are black. So when I'm talking to the community activists there, I'm saying, okay, check this out. I'm not saying we don't have a police problem, but we also have a black community problem as well. Dwayne, the violence, the epigenetics of it all. So a lot of this stuff, the systems of racism, education, uh, religion, housing, all of those systems factor into the crime that black people are perpetuating against each other. Those are problems. We cannot ignore it or we cannot overlook it, but we also have to understand what is the systemic impact of centuries of that. And I believe when you impact or you look at all of that, you have to understand that black people have been treated differently in this country. We are not the immigrant class that came looking for huddled masses and all of this stuff. We weren't those people. We were the ones who were inflicted, oppressed, suppressed, depressed, and oppressed and every other press that you can do. So therefore we need systemic, systematic program processes to honestly help us deal with this trauma because people who are traumatized, hurting people hurt people, and black people are hurting in this country, and we do need some intensive and extra help. Dwayne Bryant, I know you've dedicated your life, career, and clearly so much effort uh, to this project. Thank you for your perspective, and thanks for joining us here on Newsy. Thank you for your time. I do appreciate it. Have a great day. So what are the evidence-based, reliable solutions that are out there right now? Congress has been considering some reforms, bans on no-knock warrants and police chokeholds, those seem unlikely. So states are also looking at new methods to de-escalate these situations. Buffalo, New York's police department has used one tool in the field. I had never heard of this. Let's see if you have just a little video right here. Hola. 